Well, let's do it this way tonight. Um, the last Wednesday that I was here, we spent a lot of time thinking about those without Christ. But I'm going to divide us again like I did that time. So for those of you watching us on Facebook, I might disappear for just a minute, but here's the way we'll do it. We're going to get the biggest bulk of names by doing it this way. I'm going to take the first three rows, one, two, three rows, and I want you to pray for the nursing home residents and the homebound members. I will just call, in a moment I'll direct your attention there, and then I'm going to take the next three rows, that will be this one, one, two, and three. This is an empty row, so, mm, so you guys have to pray heavy. And you've got the middle panel, which includes the hospitalized and the special prayer needs there. And if you would, add David Nugent to that list. And then I'm going to come back to this three, one, two, three. And I guess uh, you, you'll get to pick up the middle row. You, got, you get the middle row. <laughs> you got a heavy responsibility. And then you guys pray back here with the last three rows. And then this last panel, our church families. Uh, down through the training for ministry are the names that I'm calling your attention to. And on the far sides over there, you guys can catch that. So after we've had a little bit of time of each one of you in silence praying for the p people in your panel, I'll call us all to praying for Sunday. We have had two really tremendous Sundays back to back with Palm Sunday and the Easter mu the, the musical uh, and that turnout. Not only a lot of people here, but um, a sweet time of worship. And we had some of our membership that needed special care, and the Lord brought every one of those through. You know, you, you never know what's going to happen. There's this old story about the deacons used to all sit on the front in this particular church, and one Sunday one of the deacons died during the service. They slipped out the back, and it's a joke, of course. But anyway, you, you don't have to know that. And they said, one of the deacons on the front had a heart attack and he's died. Get him out. They carried out four deacons before they found the right one. That's just an old preacher joke. It's just an old preacher joke, you know. <laughs> okay, it's just an old preacher joke. It doesn't mean anything. But after you finish praying for me, <laughs> we're going to pray in our panels as I've asked you to. And now I'm going to turn your attention to praying for Sunday, a follow-up Sunday to these two wonderful Sundays that we have had, the way the Lord has moved among us. and uh, Easter is just about always going to have a large crowd of people that are going to come, and hopefully some of those are going to be back with us, and we'll just see, continue to invite your friends and neighbors. But we're going to turn all of us, our attention to that, and then I will close us in a time of prayer. So just start out your own concerns, your own family, the things on your heart. Give them to the Lord now, would you? Now, if you would, as I've asked you by rows to pray for particular panels, would you just look at those names, pray about people that you know, pray about those that you know with their needs, and lift those to the Lord for a minute, would you? if you would turn your attention to praying for Sunday for all the pieces.
presence of the Lord and his movement among us. Dear Lord, we are thankful for your goodness to us. You demonstrate how much you love us in every conceivable way, in the beauty of the world around us, in the beauty of brothers and sisters in Christ and the love that we share with each other, in the goodness of family and of work and community. Lord, we know in every place there are challenges. We can never forget the world has fallen into sin because of the decisions that humans make. Never let us just see the sin and the harm and the hurt and the pain. Lord, minister your balm of medicine in all of those places, but let us never forget the goodness and the joy and the blessings that you pour out, us, out upon us so liberally. We thank you that we can be here tonight. We ask, Lord, that even as we're here and as we're praying together and as we're singing together and looking at your word together, that we will recognize the presence of your Holy Spirit speaking to us, encouraging us, lifting us up, giving us the grace and the strength to go on through the rest of the week. Bless us, Lord, we pray. Lord, we've taken this list, people in our church, people that we know, people who are far away, people who are close by, every one of them you know and you care about far more than we do. We ask you to work in their lives. <coughs> work for healing, work for strength, work for encouragement. Lord, we pray, especially for this Sunday, as we've had two Sundays where we've experienced your presence and your blessing in such a wonderful way. May we know it again. May we sense you moving and working among us. Call us to yourself that we may be the people you want us to be in this community. And Lord, that may be hard. and We may have to give up some things. We may have to change some ways. But we want to be your people, whatever that means and whatever it takes. We love you tonight. We love you for what you're doing in our midst and in our hearts. And we submit ourselves to you in the name of Jesus. Amen. <coughs> Through the years, I've um, I've tried to come up with my favorite hymn. And I love them all so much, but I've come to the conclusion that I don't have favorite hymns. I have favorite phrases in those hymns. Like, uh, my sin, oh, the bliss of this, that glorious thought. My sin, not in part, but the whole, is nailed to the cross, and I bear it no more. Like, bless the Lord, oh, my soul. Like, sing like never before. Like, when we've been there 10,000 years. Well, the song that we're going to sing now has one of those phrases in it. Because it says, in the heart, he implanteth a song. But what we all have to realize is, yes, it's there. But he's also given us the opportunity to put it here and produce it and lift it and encourage others with it. He's implanted a song in your heart. Let's sing it. Wonderful, wonderful view. There 
is never a day so dreary. There is never a night so long. But the soul that is trusting Jesus will somewhere find a song. Wonderful, wonderful Jesus, in the heart he implanteth a song, a song of deliverance, of courage, of strength, in the heart he implanteth a song. There is never a cross so heavy, a weight of woe, but that Jesus will help to carry because he loveth so. Wonderful, wonderful Jesus, in the heart he implanteth a song, a song of deliverance, of courage, of strength, in the heart he implanteth a song. There is never a care or burden. There is never a grief or loss, but that Jesus in love will lighten when carried to the cross. Wonderful, wonderful Jesus, in the heart he implanteth a song, a song of deliverance, of courage, of strength, in the heart he implanteth a song. There is never a guilty sinner. There is never a wandering one. But that God can in mercy pardon through Jesus Christ, his Son. Wonderful, wonderful Jesus, in the heart he implanteth a song, a song of deliverance, of courage, of strength, in the heart he implanteth a song. Thank you for singing it. Brother Woody, love those songs. <clears throat> so, obviously, I'm choking. <laughs> I'm working cough drops and mints, and if it clicks around on my teeth, <clears throat> you'll know what it is. All right, well, we're still in the book of Daniel, and we're getting closer to the end of this prayer. The prayer itself starts in verse 4 and goes through verse 19. I'm going to read in just a second verses 15 through 19, so 
I am aspirational toward the end of the prayer itself. But that's not quite the end because <clears throat> starting in verse 20, there comes a response from God. The response of God is rather lengthy, so we're not going to deal with the whole response from God, but we are going to deal with a few verses of it just to see God's, God's immediate answering towards the prayer of Daniel. So we're within the two or three Wednesdays of, of finishing this prayer up, and <clears throat> then we'll see what we do after that. So let me read this part of it. We have finally, after, in my notes, seven Wednesdays, <laughs> we have finally come to the point where Daniel's going to ask for something. The whole prayer up until this point has been confession and sorrow and grief. And so now he's just about to ask. <clears throat> His requests will be different from the ones that you're accustomed to praying yourself. There will be a request in verse 16. One in verse 17, one in verse 18, and one in verse 19, and then he'll come to the end. So more than three-fourths of the whole prayer are confession. Anyway, let me read it before I get too far into talking about it, and <clears throat> then we'll come back. And now, O Lord our God, who have brought your people out of the land of Egypt, with a mighty hand, and have made a name for yourself, as it is this day. <clears throat> we have sinned. We have been wicked. O oh Lord, in accordance with all your righteous acts, let now your anger and your wrath turn away from your city Jerusalem, your holy mountain. For because of our sins and the iniquities of our fathers, Jerusalem and your people have become a reproach to all those around us. <clears throat> Excuse me. So now, our God, listen to the prayer of your servant and to his supplications. And for your sake, O Lord, let your face shine on your desolate sanctuary. O oh my God, incline your ear and hear, open your eyes and see our desolations and the city which is called by your name. For we are not presenting our supplications before you on account of any merit of our own, but on account of your great compassion. O oh Lord, hear. O oh Lord, forgive. O oh Lord, listen. And take action for your own sake. O oh my God, do not delay, because your city and your people are called by your name. Well, we have seen in every prayer that we have looked at from the very beginning that the prayers of Scripture are typically different from our prayers. I don't know that they have parts that we don't pray. Maybe we've discovered a few of those. But just sort of in the, in the thrust and the, the passion and the content I can't remember a time when I have spent an extended period of time just in mourning and confession. Uh, not so much about my own sin because Daniel was, as we've said before, he was part of this body of people. He was part of, of Israel that was there in captivity. But it wasn't his iniquity. He hadn't turned from God. He hadn't worshipped false gods. He was not disobeying God's voice. He was obeying God's voice at great personal cost so he's not so much saying well God I did this and God I did that and forgive me like David had to do with his sin he is confessing corporately we are a people who sin we are a nation who's turned from you we are ones who have wandered into our own way we are ones who have lived culturally askew from your will so that has been his confession but it went on and on we've read it and we've gone over it in minute detail we have seen how grieved this man was for their sin and how he longed for God to be vindicated and part of that vindication is going to come clear in his request in this prayer tonight because here is what's in the background of all of this prayer of Daniel that we've touched on from time to time, but it's been a long time that we've been dealing with it, so keeping this in our minds is not completely easy to do. 
the concept in that ancient world was that your God was pretty much within the confines of your territory. Every individual nation had their own gods. The chief god of Babylon was Marduk, M-A-R-D-U-K. Um, he was sort of like Baal. I think he was a storm god. There were chief gods, but there were lots and lots of gods in all the different countries. People living in all of those different countries had the idea that within our area, within our sphere, our kingdom, our God takes care of us. He protects us. He keeps us safe. And especially in the place where his sanctuary is located. The Jewish people had that same idea, except they, for the most part, knew that all those gods in those other lands were false gods. They were not real gods. Their God, in fact, was the real God who had made them all. But they certainly shared the concept that their God was somewhat regional, even though he had made the world and he was sovereign all over the whole world. He was especially sovereign in their country. And when they were invaded in times past, they had believed that if they would hold faithful to God in some kind of ways and honor His sanctuary and do the sacrifices that God would protect them. And that idea had been vindicated when Assyria had attacked Jerusalem and laid siege to Jerusalem. And that was 800 years before, 700 years before Jesus. And so just about the time they were going to fall to Assyria, God sent a rescue and 100,000 plus people in the Assyrian army died overnight and they, they left immediately and cleared out of the place. And then the scripture says that they got up the next morning dead. I don't know how you get up dead. When, when you're dead, you don't get up. But that's basically King James. They got up dead. <clears throat> it was just a shock. And Can you imagine how those people inside the city of Jerusalem felt when overnight mass destruction on the enemy and they just pull out of there they all said oh my gracious look what God has done he has saved us as we knew he would well then here comes 587 BC and the Babylonians come and the Jewish people are again laid siege inside of Jerusalem and they are waiting for God's deliverance and it didn't come now, the prophets had said it wasn't going to come, at least Jeremiah and the ones who were true to God had said it's not going to come, and it didn't come. And they were carried off into captivity, and they're there for about 70-year period of time. And so Daniel's big concern is that the nations of the world have seen the people who claim to have the true God and the true temple and the true worship, they have seen them destroyed and the temple destroyed, and the people carried off into captivity. Daniel knows it happened not because of God's impotence. It's not that he couldn't defeat Marduk, or he couldn't defeat the Babylonians. It was because of their sin, and that's why he has confessed it over and over. We have sinned. We have been unrighteous. We have been wicked. We have turned to idols. We haven't. Our leaders did this. Our people did this. Our parents did this. All of us did this. You have, just, you have been just in your punishment. But now, O oh God, the nations see what has happened, and they are not going to understand. So vindicate yourself. Demonstrate yourself. That's in the background of all of this prayer of Daniel, and it starts becoming very clear tonight when the requests start coming to him. Up until now, he's been all confession, and now he's turning his attention to the requests. We are in our prayers mostly requests. Some adoration, appropriately so. Our confession is usually a sentence long, and it usually goes like this. Lord, forgive me where I have failed you. Isn't that it? It's kind of a broad stroke, isn't it? <laughs> forgive me where I have failed you. Well, that's better than not <laughs> anything. We might need to lean more towards the, the publican who said, Lord, have mercy on me, a sinner. But nevertheless, here we are in verse 15. And now, O Lord our God, who have brought your people out of the land of Egypt with a mighty hand and have made a name for yourself, 
as it is this day, we have sinned, we have been wicked. He has gone back and repeated again, we have sinned and we've been wicked. But for the first time, he's brought in the outstanding moment in Hebrew history when God demonstrated his power. There are many times when God has demonstrated his power. And when the Assyrians laid siege to Jerusalem, God demonstrated his power. But whenever the Hebrew people remembered the might of their God, they remembered the exodus from Egypt because they knew they had been there in slavery. They were not a people. They were a people oppressed. They were a people with no power. And God had defeated the most powerful country in the world, Egypt, to lead them into the promised land. And so there's the demonstration of God's power. To some degree, Daniel is reminding God of that. He's calling that up to attention. You brought us, your people, out of the land of Egypt with a mighty hand, and you made a name for yourself as it is to this day. Kind of remember? Of course God remembers. And I suppose, you know, we do that sort of stuff. Sometimes when we pray, we, we, we try to prompt God's memory sometimes in the way that we pray. I, I remember hearing prayers at the end of the worship service where it was something like, God, next week we're having a covered dish. Help everybody whose last name is A to M remember they're supposed to bring a meat. <clears throat> so I'm not sure if that was a prayer or if that was an announcement, but <laughs> I, I guess sometimes we prompt God in different ways, and, and that's okay. I don't think God is has a, a scoreboard around prayer saying, you know, that's just not the right way to pray. I, I'm not going to listen to that one. You pray from your heart. He's going to hear. I mean, just like a, parent, a child with their parent. If your little baby toddler child comes to you and doesn't speak in proper English, says, want Cheerio. You're not going to say, you're supposed to say, I want Cheerios. You hear and you understand and you look past the grammatical mistakes. And I believe God is that way with us. When we are sincere and we come before Him, that He doesn't have a scoreboard saying, this, you haven't prayed quite right. That's not the kind of prayer I honor. He looks at your heart. That's why you don't even have to say words. You can just stand before God. You can just lift up your murmuring to God. I don't mean murmuring is in a negative thing, but the, the murmur of your heart, the the cry of your soul and he will love to hear it so he's not upset that Daniel reminds him of it because I think more than Daniel is reminding God Daniel is reflecting back over the history of the Hebrew people and he's remembering what God has done now that's a really good thing it's a really good thing to do in your life in your personal life in your prayer life to, to Come before God with a request. God, here is, here's where I am. Here's where my family is. Here's where my children are. Here's where my grandchildren are. Here's where I am in my health. Whatever it might be. And you say, God, I remember when you brought me out of darkness into light. God knows that. You're not have reminding Him, but you're celebrating the mighty works of God. I remember when you rescued my marriage all those many years ago. I remember when you saved my derelict child. I remember when I almost had that horrible accident and you intervened and saved me from that. I remember your mighty works. That's good prayer. Not so much that you're reminding God, you're celebrating the great works of God. And it will help you when you remember the mighty works of God in your life when you're facing the next place you need a mighty work of God too as you will remember back and you will see what God has done, how His hand has worked in your life, and you will, in greater trust, move into whatever the difficulty or the darkness or the challenge is that is ahead of you because you will have remembered His great works in your life in the past. Now, it's one that we don't really think about or we try to push off into a dark spot. But for the believer, for the believer... One of the greatest works of God, if not the greatest work of God, is when He takes us home. 
Now, I'm not saying that tomorrow I'm ready to go home. Well, I hope I am. I hope I am. I would be pleased if God would give me a little bit more time. I'd like to see some of those grandchildren get married and, you know, they're going to expect me to pay the college bill. Maybe I want to come on home. <clears throat> I, I would kind of like to do some of that. That's okay. That's okay. There's no problem with that. But hold in your mind that when God takes us home, that's not a moment of defeat. That's not a moment that demonstrates God's weakness. That's a moment that demonstrates His strength because He's taken you from this veil of tears to that place of glory, hallelujah, celebration all the time. That's what the Scripture says. And we're crazy, but we believe it. So, even if it comes to that point in your life where you say, Lord, I celebrate all the wonderful things that you did in my life, and thank you for that. And Now, I want this one to happen too. And God takes me home. Well, don't you guys say, well, I guess God couldn't do that one, could he? Well, sure he could have done that one. God's own reasoning and his own timing and his own plan, he'll take us all home, one way or the other. And that won't be a defeat, that'll be a celebration. That'll be a victory. Well, finally, we've gotten to the request, verse 16. That's very interesting here, it seems to me. There are four requests. Somewhat, it looks to me like there are four requests. There, there are more words than that. But in each of these verses, it's like he lays a request in front of God and then he sort of gives a reason or a justification or why he made that request. Look, for example, in 16. Oh, Lord. Oh, by the way, almost all of these start with something like an interjection, kind of like that. Oh, Lord. Then verse 17. So now our God, verse 18. Oh, my God, verse 19. Oh, Lord, hear. That one, it just gets really... Hear, forgive, listen. But back to 16. Here's the request. Oh, Lord. In accordance with all your righteous acts... Let now your anger and your wrath turn away from your city, Jerusalem, your holy mountain. So there's the request. Let your anger turn away. There's been about 70 years when that place has been left in desolation and his people have been carried off into captivity and they're still there. Oh, it would be like, you know, if somehow or another you got forced to leave Texas and drug off to Arkansas and you had to live there 70 years. Oh, God, may I get back to Texas? And he says, no. <laughs> well, you'd be crying out. Why are you so angry? Let me go back home. Oh, okay, I'm being silly. I'm sorry. <clears throat> but that's, there they were still in captivity. So turn your anger, turn your wrath away from your city. And now comes the because clause. For because of our sins and the iniquities of our fathers, Jerusalem and your people have become a reproach to all those around us. So, so there's a request and a kind of an explanation. I'm asking you, Lord, to take your, your anger and your wrath, turn it away from Jerusalem, your holy mountain, the place where the temple was. Take your wrath away because of what has gone on and continues to go on, Jerusalem and your people have become a reproach to all those around us. Now that's where I was kind of starting a while ago in that the nations of the world would have said, well, you're God's impotent. He can't do anything. He can't protect you. He sent you into captivity. He let your temple be destroyed. His temple be destroyed. If he was any kind of God, that would have not happened. And now you say, we're going back and you haven't gone back. All the peoples of the world would have looked at them and said, your God is nothing. That's the reproach. That's, that's his great fear. His, his great fear is that God will not be revered by the people of the world. And so that's his first request, turn your anger away. And he's interpreting anger as being evident because they're still in captivity 
Jerusalem is still in desolation. Temple is not functioning. There are no sacrifices happening. None of the worship that they were accustomed to is happening whatsoever. And so, Lord God, because Jerusalem and your people have become a reproach to all those around us. Well, now you go to 17. There's a request and there's a because clause, so to speak, as well. So now, our God, listen to the prayer of your servant and to his supplications. There's the request. Listen to the prayer. Now, God is listening to the prayer. He's not going to not listen to the prayer. But this is the plea of his heart. In Daniel's mind, he will know that God has listened to the prayer when he has gotten some kind of clear response from God. Now, it is our deep and firm belief that God hears every prayer that we pray. And I don't have to demand from God that he somehow demonstrate himself that he's heard it. But every once in a while, you know, some prayers are far more serious than other prayers, but I think all prayers have a worthiness to them. Thank you for the other one. The little tickle's coming. Ooh, that one, tangy. <laughs> <coughs> so when I pray for that prayer list and these people who come to know Christ, that's a very serious prayer. And I take it seriously. But there are other times in life, and you've been there too, whenever there are things that are going on that are not the magnitude of somebody needing to come to Christ, but there's something in your life that you have, that you're feeling really frustrated over. Now I'm going to give you a little case in point, and you might say that's the most unworthy prayer I ever heard. But it surely helped me on this day. I was working on my car, and if you ever need prayer, it's when you're working on your car. And so somebody had bumped the back of the car and had cracked the, the light. And it had shattered a little bit. And I couldn't afford to buy a new... You can't just get the little lens. It's that whole big rigmarole that has to be replaced. A couple of hundred bucks. and It would not pass inspection like that because it had to kind of... It all had to be there. And I knew if I could get every shard that had broken out and get them back in there and glue them in place, it would do fine for a while. And I had found all the shards and glued them all back in there except for one. And it was, I don't know how big it was, but and I knew it was around. I knew it had been there. And I looked and I looked. You know how when you know something that's close by or you'd put it somewhere and you look for it and you can't find it? That becomes a daily experience once you get over about 65. And I looked and I looked and I was so frustrated because if I couldn't find it, I was going to have to buy a whole new thingy. That's a technical mechanics term for the thingy. And I said in my desperation, Oh, God, please, find that thing. Have you ever felt that kind of desperation over stuff that is of such little importance? And I turned around in a spot that I'd looked at a dozen times, and there it was. Now, I don't know how it got there, if I had been blind every other time that I looked at it, but I had never seen it until I asked God for His help, and then there it was. I said... Thank you, God. And I picked that thing up and I put some glue on it and stuck it in the hole and I went down past inspection. Now, I don't know if that was a worthy prayer or not, but it was, it was a burden on my heart. Now, all of my prayers are not helping me find that, although they're getting more frequent. You know, they're getting me more frequent. <laughs> I still pray about some things of true substance. <laughs> but in this prayer here, <laughs> oh my goodness, <laughs> God, listen to the prayer of your servant and his supplications. And God did. 
and God listens to your prayers and your supplications. And you can even put a little shard in his hands. And for your sake, O oh Lord, let your face shine on your desolate sanctuary. So again, he's concerned about the reputation of God. For your sake, this is not for our sake, this is for your sake. Answer this prayer. And then my favorite one in this list of four is the next one. Where he's just about gotten to the high moment of his prayer. Oh my God. My God. He's gotten really personal now. He's talked about, oh Lord at the first, our God at the second, and now my God in verse 18. Oh my God. Incline your ear and hear. Open your eyes and see our desolations and the city which is called by your name. Same sort of idea, the vindication of God and His reputation. But look at this one. Here's the for portion, the because portion of the prayer. For we are not presenting our supplications before you on account of any merit of our own, but on account of your great compassion. Oh my goodness, what a phrase is that. God never answers us because of our merit. What merit do we have to bring to Him? He loves us. He sent His Son to die for us. We have great value, but I don't have merit in the sense that I have earned His response. We're not in some kind of quid pro quo with God, some kind of transactional deal. I'll do this, you do that. Now, we've talked about those kind of prayers before, and even those, sometimes God will answer. My seminary professor on the metal deck of the ship in World War II and bullets all around him saying, God, if you'll save me, I'll be a preacher. And God saved him, and he became a preacher. Even those kind of prayers, God will honor sometimes, but not because of our merit. We don't come to him because we've earned some kind of thing but we come to him because of the last part of the sentence that we just read. On account of any merit of ours, but on account of your great compassion. His wonderful love. And because he loves us, we can almost think about our going to him like I know my grandchildren think about coming to me. They don't think for a second. Maybe even... A better picture of it is an old picture from the period of John F. Kennedy when he was president. So for some of us, we weren't even born yet, but most of us in here were. <laughs> There's this great picture of, of uh, President Kennedy at his desk, and he's with some others there. Some of you may be shaking your head. You, you remember the picture. And he's, here's the president of the United States. Nobody goes to the President of the United States like, you know, hey, bud, how you doing? But under the desk is John John playing. Oh, he was easy and comfortable in the presence of the President because the President wasn't present to him. He was dead. <laughs> so here's the God who loves us with this kind of compassion that we come to Him as Abba, Father. Not because we've earned His response to our prayers, but because we know that He loves us that way. So we must never be shy, never be timid of going to the One who loves us more than life itself and laying in front of Him every need, every pain, every desire, every joy, whatever it is, we give it to Him because He loves us that way. And then the last part of the prayer, oh, shame on Daniel, he does not say amen. Everybody knows you're supposed to end the prayer with amen. He just chops it off. He got pretty close. He did say, by your name, instead of in your name we pray. He said, by your name, but close enough. So here is this string of, of, of you know, kind of deep emotion. Oh, Lord, hear, oh Lord, forgive, oh Lord, listen. Take action. There is the request in verse 19. Take action for your own sake. 
oh my God, do not delay. And now he comes back to that idea, the vindication of God. Your city and your people are called by your name. So when you act, the nations of the world will know that you are God and that you have done a mighty work. So that's where he stops his prayer. Now, next Wednesday, we're going to see the aftermath, but I just want to say this much about it. God immediately answered him. In a very clear, visible way, I guess it's an angel, it's Gabriel, who appears beside him and said, God's heard your prayer. I've never had an angel that stood beside me saying, God heard your prayer. I've never had that. But I've told you this story before, and it's so. But most of you weren't here unless you were watching by Facebook. <clears throat> it was a. I, I can tell this story. So anyway, you've heard it before. <clears throat> so I was reading one night, late at night. I was reading uh, Dietrich Bonhoeffer, "The Cost of Discipleship." Not not easy reading, but. Um, it was helping me go to sleep. You know, that's what you do. You just read a hard book and you'll go to sleep for too long. But Dietrich was keeping me awake as I was kind of reading through him. He's talking about the cost of discipleship. But there was a place in there that was talking about the evident love of God. And it just made me stop for a moment. And I said, oh God, oh God. How do I know you love me? How do I know? I said, I know this woman who's sound asleep. I know this woman loves me. And one of the ways I know is that she just kisses me. Can you talk to God about kisses? I hope so. She kisses me and she shows me that she loves me. How do I know you love me? And that woman sat up in bed reached over and grabbed my shirt and pulled me over and kissed me and pushed me back and rolled over and she never even woke up. <laughs> I sat, I laid there in bed and went, boom, my eyes got that big. What just happened? I asked her the next morning, do you remember kissing me last night? <laughs> she had no memory whatsoever in the world of that. And I didn't think that stuff out loud. I was talking to God. That time, that night, God said, here's your answer, bud. Here's your answer. Sometimes God does that. You find the shard. You get the kiss. You get the response. You, you, a verse comes to you somehow or another. You got God's answer. And Daniel, that night, that moment, got God's answer so thank God let's pray Father thank you that everything that's in our heart everything that's on our mind everything that weighs on us everything that gives us joy everything we can bring to you and share it with you Lord, may we learn from Daniel that we can lay our sin and our pride and our pain and the sin of our world and our country and our community and our church. We can place all these in your hands and ask you to work through, work in us. Lord, we do pray that on occasion we will see your answer in quick and swift ways. And that too will demonstrate how much you love us. Thank you for these people here tonight who love you, Lord. And will go back into this community to demonstrate the love of Christ to those who need it. Help us to do that, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you, everybody, for being here tonight.